I'm Scott Al Miller. This is my vlog of daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua. Today we're going to talk a little bit about understanding some very important business principles behind the scenes when it comes to things like importing goods because we had a number of discussions that came up uh, and, and just recently because we did this big thing about importing goods and people missed a lot of important points. Some are things we didn't talk about, some are things that we did. And so I'm going to delve into that because I, a lot of people who haven't worked in an import business or a resale business where you have to deal with some of the stuff, even in your home country, may have no idea how this stuff plays out and why it works the way it does. So it's not really specifically a video about Nicaragua, but it does apply to those of you who are looking at moving abroad and it will apply pretty much anywhere. So it's really good relocation, travel, and business information. So we're going to get to that back to the box. When it comes to importing goods into a country, there's a lot of aspects of this that people don't generally think about simply because it doesn't come up in normal life. I mean, let's face it, how many people do their own importation of anything into your home country? You may order products from abroad, but you're not importing them. You're simply placing an order with an online retailer who happens to be abroad, and I'm recording this on a lens that I bought from China and you know, sent it to the United States where I officially live, and when I I sent it, I simply went on their website, placed an order, and they shipped it. I didn't know where it was coming from. Sure, I could like dig in and figure it out. I could tell when FedEx picked it up. They said they picked it up in China. It's like, whoa, this is coming from China. That's interesting, right? But like, other than that, I had no idea before I shipped it and I didn't have to do anything and I don't have to do anything. Why is that? Because the company I ordered from, Suri, in this particular case, with the beautiful Suri cinema lenses, they take care of all that. They just simply do an online ordering, they package with FedEx, and either they deal with importation or they pay FedEx or one of FedEx partners to deal with importation. There's choices, right? There's lots of ways to handle it, depending on how big you are and all kinds of things, but they're paying importation duties. And those duties for a camera lens are incredibly low. The United States does not have import controls, particularly on camera lenses, and they don't have import controls on Chinese goods in general. I know that people think that they do, but on average they don't, and it's pretty pretty easy to import and everyone's treated the same. If I was handling the importation and I was the one going and getting it and shipping it to myself rather than having someone in China ship it to me, someone I didn't know was in China ship it to me, then I would have had to have dealt with all the importation. I'd have had to deal with paying the port and the authorities who look at it and all those kinds of things, which is very doable and people do this every day. That's what being an importer is. So that's something that's just a normal thing. So you may be ordering products. You go to Shein and you place an order that is handled by, through the import process by Shein. They do it every day. They're a big company. They have deals for that. The Port Authority knows they're shipping in clothing or whatever, and it's easy to check. And they just, it's all very straightforward. But it gives you the impression that you can order things from overseas and simply bring them in and not have to worry about anything because the prices reflect that you've already paid that duty. Whatever is needed is all handled by the system. And so it gives you kind of a false impression of how easy it is. Behind the scenes, a lot of work is generally going on and often a lot of the cost of the product that you're getting is actually the import cost you just don't see it broken out in any way, so you don't realize that that is happening. Now, if you're a business that handles resale especially, and you're importing goods, you're going to know a lot more about this. So if you wanna run your own import business, you're gonna to have to start paying that import duty. And if you wanna say, for example, you wanna run a lens store, and you don't want Suri uh, dealing with the importation, because you're gonna import from a bunch of different players, you wanna be able to go to individuals who don't have import, uh, export deals, all kinds of things, and you wanna bring it in yourself, you are going to have to handle all of the import. You're going to have to pay for that. Normally, you just have a person who handles it at the port, but you could do it personally. You have options, right? So when you do that, let's say that you're running a lens store, and so you go, you shop abroad, you find some artisans in, in Afghanistan, and they make lenses by hand, and they're fantastic, right? And you, you think you're going to want to sell them in the United States. So you go to Afghanistan, you meet with these people, and you say, I want to sell your lenses in the U.S. And they go, well, that's great. I don't know how to get them to you. You say, don't worry, don't worry. You package them in boxes, wrap them up all nice and safe. I'll pick them up and ship them to the U.S. I'll take care of all that. Fantastic, that's a business model. That's how import businesses the world over 
work. And my niece even runs a business that does this, which is fantastic. She's in her early 20s and figured out how to handle import. She went around the world, not so much in person, did research, found products from artisans that she wanted to sell, unique pieces, not through vendors, and dealt with and continues to deal with being an importer. She doesn't handle export, she handles the import. And that's her business, the primary, the two big things that make her business what it is. One is the marketing of those products, and the other is the import. She handles this really complicated things. If you wanted to go get the same products as she has, could you track down the artisans? Yes, you could. Could you import their goods and bypass her? Yes, you could. But doing so would take an a, a incredible amount of time to get a small number of goods. It works for her because she runs a store that sells them in bulk. And so because of that, it's worth her effort to set up the import relationships, find the artisans, go through all that, and deal with large imports through customs and pays for that. So that's how her business works. That's where her value comes from. If they allowed individuals to do that and not go through that process, well, then they would bypass her. They would pay less than she does, and they would just bring things in very quickly. This is an important thing. So no matter what your business is, you're doing this lens business, I do this import, I'm paying to bring those lenses in. Let's say they make the lens for $100 in Afghanistan. I, I, that, that's what I pay them for it, right? That's their, their selling on the street price. There's not very many, many lenses sold on the street in Afghanistan, it's just an example. And before you all rush out to Kabul thinking you're gonna get some amazing deal on lenses, and uh, so we bring in these lenses and I pay, let's say, $50 per lens to get them in through U.S. imports between and then maybe another $50 in shipping. Right. So we're looking at a, that, that would be pretty high in shipping. But for the import, that's reasonable. But just for numbers. So now it has cost me cost me $200 to get this lens in my hand, not to mention my time, my effort, my research, my passion, all that. Now I have this lens. I'm going to market it. That's going to cost some money. I've got a store in a warehouse. That's going to cost some money. But that those those numbers are small. And then at the end of the day, I need to make some money and actually make it worthwhile to do all these things. So I'm going to sell this lens for a list price in the United States of $300. That's not going to make me very much money. I would have to sell crazy numbers of these lenses to make it worthwhile. But let's assume it's a really hot item and I'm able to do so. So I'm able to work with this markup of only about $100. My value in all this is that I paid all the things I'm supposed to do. If someone else wants to compete with me, they have to do all the same things, right? They have to go find these people. They have to pay all these imports. That all makes sense. It's pretty straightforward. Now imagine if someone is coming from Afghanistan as a tourist, they're allowed to fill their their uh, luggage up with these lenses, pack as many as they're allowed to get in, come in, they don't have to pay that $50 import duty. They come right in and they come into the country and they're like, you know what, I'm just gonna sell these and they'll sell them for $40 less than I do. $40 less. Now, if they do that, their profit is higher than mine by $10 because they have all the same expenses except they don't have to pay the $50 import because they're just bringing it in in luggage. And now they have a $50 advantage over me and are making $10, I'm sorry, a $40 price advantage and they're making $10 more than me. Well, if they sell them to my audience, why would anyone buy from me? They're cheaper by $40 and they have more money to throw at marketing. They have more money to keep themselves afloat. They don't have to sell as many lenses to put food on the table as I do because I have to earn $10 less while they're cheaper. So you can see in this process really quickly, if you bypass paying the same import duties that one business has to pay, that not only are you stealing from the government, so you're stealing from the people of the country, right? Because you're not paying, that's where a lot of the revenue of any given country comes from, is the, the taxes and import duties on goods coming in. But you're also stealing directly from every business who sells that and similar products who are paying their duties. Another example would be you want to run a restaurant. Let's say you're you're in California and the new $20 uh, you know, per hour wages are going on with, with fast food. So you've got one fast food restaurant on one block and another fast food restaurant on the next block. And they're basically identical. And one goes, you know what? Uh, my employees, they... Um, they're, they're scared for their jobs. They're, they're all right uh, on that level. They're not that good and no one will hire them. I'm gonna secretly not pay them minimum wage. I'm gonna pay them $10 an hour instead of 20. Okay, you'd probably get caught if you did that, but 
This really happens in a lot of countries. A lot of people are afraid for their jobs. I can't say anything, I'll get fired, and someone who's willing to work for less than minimum wage will come in. I have worked in places in the United States who did exactly that. They were one of the major employers in town. You knew you could be blacklisted. They went through a lot of processes to pay off some people so no one would investigate. They, they did a bunch of things. They knew what they were doing, and they got people below minimum wage, and no one said anything, because what could you do if you said anything? You were gone. Of course, that's illegal but you you were making less than minimum wage you don't have access to lawyers they knew it would work so they were stealing from the people so if you have these two fast food restaurants one's paying the minimum wage and they're paying what they're required to pay and they're being as competitive as they can be and the other's like we're just not going to pay minimum wage we're not even going to pay taxes because then it would show up that we were not, weren't paying a minimum wage and so they're spending a third, a quarter as much money per person, which is the largest expense in a fast food restaurant, than their competitor, who's still only paying minimum wage. They're not paying like extra, they're paying the least they're allowed to pay. Well, which one is going to win? Sure, if they get caught, the one that's abiding by the law is likely to win. But if they don't get caught, if people really do look the other way, then the one that's not paying their taxes and not paying their employees as much, even if they sell the exact same amount of food, one might go bankrupt while the other is profitable. But in the real world, the one that's paying less can make better food, have better ingredients, be open longer hours, do all kinds of things, and still have a higher profit margin than the one that has to pay between two and four hundred percent of the of the labor expenses as the first one. That's an incredible amount of difference in business. And so those little bits like, oh, well, the hamburger over here is $10 and it has to be to pay for $20 an hour workers. But the hamburger at this one can be $7 an hour. And while the profit on the $10 hamburger might be $1, the profit on the $7 hamburger could easily be $3 to $4. And so they could be cheaper while making tons more money. So not only are they making more money on every hamburger they sell, but they are very likely selling hundreds of times more hamburgers because if they're even close who's going to spend 10 when one block away you can get one for seven and this is a real thing that happens in in countries you don't realize this so much if you're not in business but lots of places won't play their, pay their employees fair wages they won't pay minimum wage they've got some way that they think they're going to get away with it and often they do but not always and they're literally stealing from the other businesses down the street who are paying their taxes and it drives them into the ground. And, and then people are afraid. Well, I can't speak out against the ones that are stealing because the ones that aren't stealing risk bankruptcy from the lack of margins and a lack of audience because they can be cheaper at the places that aren't paying as well. So I have to not say anything because if I say anything, I could be blacklisted when the one that's paying its bills goes out of business. And so even when there seems like a lot of recourse, employee, it doesn't matter if employees have recourse, it only matters if employees think they have recourse, but that's getting off topic. So what came up was the idea that if coming to Nicaragua, and that's just the example of where people were coming to, it, this is a general example, but they're coming from a, one country and moving to another, and they want to bring household goods with them. And yes, in very small amounts where it's really reasonable for travel, you generally don't have to do an import. But if you're bringing in commercial items, stationary items, things that are going to be, become part of a house, or a bunch of things where it's clear that you're moving in a household, you are generally going to have to pay import duties or taxes on them. And it, different countries handle this in different ways, but basically you come through customs, you declare all the stuff you're bringing in, it's permanent, it's going to stay, you're importing it. You're importing it exactly the same as every business in the country that sells those goods. So let me give a real example in the real world of exactly why the government does not want to give you and why businesses would be upset if they gave you a free pass to bring in household goods without paying import duties. So let's talk about blenders. Let's say you're coming into a country and you have a blender that you love. It's a big industrial blender and it does just a fantastic job of making smoothies and you've decided that you want to bring it in. Absolutely fantastic. I know of no country in the world that doesn't allow you to import a blender. It's not a controlled substance basically anywhere. But you're generally going to be expected, you may get caught, you may not, but you're generally expected to have to pay import duties on that because it is not a travel item. It is a permanent household good that you're bringing in with the intention of leaving permanently in wherever you're taking it. Presumably. In this example, yes. Okay, so let's say you're moving into the United States. You're coming from wherever you're coming from. You're moving into the United States and you bring this item in. Of course, under most circumstances, the U.S. is going to let it slide. They're going to look the other way because you are just not that often that this is happening and it's not worth the effort of trying to track you down. That's 
reality. But if it comes down to legality, do you need to declare that you're bringing in household goods that you are not going to ever leave the country with, that it is not traveling with you, you are not a tourist, but your intention is to stay indefinitely and to keep this item with you? Absolutely, you have to declare that. You'd also have to declare that you plan on not leaving the country, which almost always would cause other problems. But you would be required to declare this, because if you didn't declare it, you would legally, literally, and legally, for under certain circumstances, be an immigrant who is coming in and stealing from Americans by literally stealing their jobs. You would be stealing from the tax system, which is something that belongs to the public, so you steal just a little bit from every American, and you would then be stealing from all the businesses that import legally and pay their duties on blenders and all of the employees who work for them, because somewhere, if people did this with any regularity, there would be people who lose their jobs because you're doing the import and sales of that product instead of them. Now you say, but I'm not selling anything. I'm just bringing it in for me. That's fine. You're acting in this case. At that moment that you cross the border, you are the importer for yourself. So while it's a very small scale, you are bringing in an item and the profits that should go to the, the government for the importation of that foreign good and the companies that do that as their free market capitalism make their money, that's how they function, jobs don't get to do them. And so literally, it is actually a form of theft from the people. And the thing that Americans like to say, which is generally not very true, but does sometimes happen, ah, there are immigrants coming in and stealing our jobs. This is a spot where it would apply. Not an entire job, a part of a job, but if you had lots of immigrants do it, somebody's job would be lost. It's not a thing that immigrants normally do. It's not expected that you have some huge mass of people coming to the United States from all over the world going, you know what, America just has too expensive of blenders, I'm bringing my own. It's not a realistic thing. But let's flip that and now we're going to look at Nicaragua. When you're looking at Nicaragua or any country like this and people are coming from the United States, the numbers flip dramatically. It doesn't take very much for the country that you're coming to to be heavily affected by the large number of people coming from abroad, simply because they're small countries and the U.S., as an example, is a large country. That alone changes a lot of dynamics. That's why the U.S. can afford to look the other way in a lot of things because the number of people coming from Nicaragua to the United States is a drop in the bucket. I realize that we talk often about how many Nicaraguans do that. And as a percentage of Nicaraguans, yes, it's a large percentage, but as a physically absolute number of people crossing the border into the U.S., it's actually a very small number, right? Because the U.S. is an enormous country. It's all just relations, right? So when we're looking in the other way, it only takes a handful of Americans coming down to represent the entire import of blender market, right? If every Nicaraguan going to the United States took a blender to the north, the blender vendors in the United States, the blender vendors, would barely notice the change. It would be such a tiny number. They would not really register a drop off in blender sales because of this. And the U.S. tax base would not notice a change in tax base. It would happen, but it wouldn't be noticeable, probably. But if you did it in the opposite direction and said the Americans coming into Nicaragua all brought with them a blender and aren't going to buy it in country, you could literally, potentially, this would be a stretch, but it could, it could happen, that the entire annual blender import market would be devastated. There would be no need for any company that brings in blenders and sells them to bring in any blenders and sell them for an entire year because every American coming in represented as many blenders as get sold in the country within a year. And you say, but that doesn't make any sense. Only the Americans would have them. Who, how is everyone else going to get a blender? But this is important. Nobody keeps their household appliances for forever. I know that we act like, well, it's permanent. We're going to have it. But at some point, you're gonna want a new one. And at that point, maybe you'll buy one in country, maybe you'll import one again in your luggage and not pay for your import. But your old one, sometimes they burn out, absolutely. And I've burned through a lot of blenders while living here, so it's a bad example of things that you'll keep for super long. But you have this blender, you're probably gonna give it to someone or you might resell it to someone. And again, those transactions means now it's in the general population and someone who must have purchased one inside the country or gotten one from someone who did purchase one from inside the country doesn't have to because they got it through this other process. So yes, it's very unlikely that it would completely wipe out the entire blender import market, but it would significantly impact it because the percentage of Americans who come 
to the country represents a, a very noticeable percentage of total blender buyers within Nicaragua, whereas all Nicaraguans going to the United States do not represent a significant percentage of the blender buyers. This example provides some of the strangest tongue twisters that you can imagine in anything. Blender vendors, blender buyers, it's all very strange. Anyway, so this gives you a little bit of an idea that there's a reason why they're very adamant about taxing these things. One is that it is a fundamental part of the income of the country and a very core reason why uh, expats are welcome to come to the country because it's expected that you will either buy things in the country or pay for importing them. In either case, that's absolutely fine. If you want to bring in a blender and pay the import on it, the government's getting their tax base from sales tax equivalent and those things, so they're, they're happy. And eventually that product is going to be added to the income stream of the country, whether it just gets used or it gets sold or gets given away. The country has gained a blender on top of whatever duties and taxes that you've paid coming in. So they're happy if you do that. If you don't do that, you come into the country and you just buy a blender here. They're, fan, they're super thrilled about that too because you've then paid into a business here in the country. They make their profits. They hire employees and that creates the employment base for the country. That's great too. Either way, the system is set up that you can, you can choose. It is completely up to you how you want to do it and it's just whether you want to pay your, in, your import duties directly, personally, or you want the business you buy it from to do so. Now, a couple of people said this. Now, one of them I spoke to offline, and he's like, oh, yeah, I didn't think that through. Of course, that's bad, right? But some people got pretty belligerent in the comments, and, and I want to mention this because uh, what people said, and, and this is a repeated thing, but the country shouldn't charge me an import because they should be thankful that I'm coming and I'm going to spend money in the country. I want to break this down a little bit, right? So if this was in reverse, well, Nicaraguans are moving to the United States. Do you want to, because uh, most of the people who, who are watching the channel are Americans, but think of it, apply your country, right? Do you want immigrants coming to your country, sneaking goods over the border, not paying their taxes, and are you just happy that they're coming to spend money? The answer in nearly all cases is no. Very few people would be happy if you described that. Now, if they're you know coming and bringing value and they need you know they're refugees, there's a lot of times where we're like, yes, come, great, right, welcome. So you know I don't want to be negative to immigration because immigration is an important thing around the world. But it's important to remember when Americans are coming to Nicaragua or anybody is coming to Nicaragua that you're the immigrants. We say expats because we like to feel good about ourselves, and that's fine. Right, but remember, all the Nicaraguans going to the United States are expats. All the Americans coming to Nicaragua are immigrants. The two are interchangeable. The only thing is that when we say immigrant, we tend to be kind of open as to whether it's a temporary or permanent thing. And when we say expat, we generally assume an intention, but not a requirement, that you'll be permanent. Whereas digital nomad is definitely implied that you'll be non-permanent, but basically a temporary immigrant. That's about it, those are the only differences. And a lot of people complain that we say expat because it really is misleading. We should be saying immigrant, and that helps to make it clear that we are guests of the country we are going to, regardless of what direction we're going. It shows that we don't wanna be in a position of taking jobs away from someone. Like these are all things that when you, when you hear people coming into your own country, you're like, oh, they could take my jobs. Oh, they could be like all these bad things. And we always hope that whoever comes in is coming in with good intentions and, and good value and is going to help with our country, right? And that's, that's probably the case in most cases. But, but, and this is really key, the idea that Nicaragua should be automatically excited to have an immigrant come to their country, because remember, we're basically just invited refugees, right? Why are we here? Well, we're all here for different reasons. Some of you are here for the weather. Some of you are coming because of the cost of living. Some are coming for the great health care. Some come because of the food. Some of you just really want rice and beans every morning for breakfast. Real thing, you'd be surprised how many people are like, I, I gotta have Gallo Pinto. I can't keep living without it in my life. Surprisingly, that's like a thing. And when you're coming, you're essentially a refugee. Now, I realize and it's not quite the same, right? When you have like serious refugees, it's like we're leaving a situation that's so dire, but you're still coming from someplace that is failing to provide you the desired living situation for whatever it is, whether food, cost of living, doesn't matter. And you are, as an immigrant, moving to another country, hoping that that country will provide you the mix of things that makes your life better for you. That's why I'm here. 
right? And that's why you would be considering it. And that's great, that's fantastic. And Nicaragua, under normal circumstances, is super thrilled that it can provide those things for you. But it's really important for us to remember we are guests. Nicaragua is doing us the courtesy of allowing us to come and try living here in the country. And the idea that they should be happy just because we're bringing in a foreign income, if we're truly bringing in a significant foreign income, that generally checks a, this is a happy checkbox, absolutely, right? That's not false in any way. That's absolutely true. Bringing in foreign income is very valuable to the country. However, it is important to note that part of the reason that a foreign income is valuable to the country is the expectation that that foreign income will be spent in the country. If it is not spent in the country, then it does not have value. Presumably, if you have an income and you're living in the country, it's very hard not to spend it in the country, so that's okay, right? You don't have to go out of your way to like specifically do this. But the most important aspects of that is in job creation and paying taxes. Now, you don't pay income taxes here in Nicaragua. We've talked about this a bit, but you do pay sales tax and those kinds of things. And you pay for goods and services whose built-in price pays for the, the income tax of the employees who provide those services or make those products. Right? You go to a restaurant, they're paying uh, business taxes and their employees are paying income taxes. So you, as a customer, are paying the taxes, but it's, it's secondhand. And that's fine. That's how the system is designed. And they're happy when you do that. But when we have this discussion and say, but I expect to go through customs and not have to pay my taxes, I should get to not pay an import fee that a Nicaraguan would have to pay, that a Nicaraguan business would have to pay. Suddenly you're not, whatever your income is somewhere else, you're not using that income to pay the things that you need to pay. And in fact, technically it would be stealing from these companies and these employees. Now, I understand why it's hard to under, it's hard to like see that when you're coming in, you're like, I'm just bringing some stuff in my luggage, but it's a different situation because you're talking about an import as an immigrant into a third party country where those goods need to be brought in through Im import controls and sold on the market with taxes and employment and all those things. And if the same thing was happening in reverse to your own country, it would be a lot clearer that, oh, are people bringing in goods and not paying their duties that are my tax base that pay for my roads? Oh, I don't like that. Exactly. And when we do it in reverse, it's actually, oh, that's, no, that's not a great thing, but it's hard to see. So I totally understand why people just don't see this as a thing and don't really sit around and think about, oh, I'm bringing something in permanently. But when a tourist comes to the United States or Canada, whatever, it's really clear when you're acting like a tourist, I brought some clothes to wear on my trip and my toothbrush, or when they're not acting as a tourist. Oh, I brought up, you know, new piping for my house that I'm building. Wait, 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 why are you building a house as a tourist? You're not a tourist, you're trying to be a resident. And that's great, but you have to pay for those things the same as any other person who's trying to be a resident, right? It's all about paying the same thing. So when we have that case where it's like, well, I don't wanna pay these taxes. Well, that, that behavior creates a scenario where the money you're bringing in is no longer a value if you're not willing to pay it into the system and instead using it against the system. So really quickly, you can end up not being a welcomed guest because you're, you're not intentionally, I'm sure, but accidentally cheating the system and that behavior will lead to big problems. The people who live here, they don't want their jobs lost because you're importing stuff. They don't, businesses don't wanna lose their revenue because you're importing stuff. The government doesn't wanna lose its taxes because you're importing stuff. Those are critical pieces to being a good guest, being invited to a country. So I hope, I hope that that explains why it's so important and why we would want to, right, pay our taxes. Right, coming from another country, I understand no one wants to pay taxes. No one just wants to pay extra things, but it is of important value. It's what makes us as guests of the country more valuable. It is how we contribute most directly. And if we're feeling like we don't wanna do those things, if we don't have a sense of we should pay the same taxes as everyone else, right? I understand, we all want to be the one exception. All of us want to have fewer taxes, but no one really wants to have society where everyone doesn't pay the same tax base because that creates just everything falls apart economically and it can't, it can't function the way, the things that make any country you wanna to go to work the way you want it to work is because everyone's paying the taxes. That's what the tax base is for. Thanks for joining me, like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. As always, like, subscribe, share on social media, tell your friends about the show and I will see all of you tomorrow. And I'll really quickly, pop some videos up on the screen. Just click on one of those, that helps a lot to promote the show.